Thank you very much, and I'm really embarrassed because I have no idea which typeface that is. So I promise you, Jürgen, for Berlin, I will know my typeface and I will make sure that it is a really fantastic one. Thank you for battling through the snow. I have started a hashtag which is called London Snow Stories. And I think we in London are very happy about that because we're generally awkward in small talk, aren't we? And there's going to be small talk afterwards. And I would really ask you to share all of your snow stories with me because then I can talk to you about snow stories. You'll make my life much easier. Thank you. I'm Alex and I'm trying to figure out where this is. This is starting fantastically. Mind the hype. We're going to talk a little bit about the hype. The hype in innovation. And you're going to probably think, oh my God, it's fantastic. It's going to be a digital innovation conference. I'm going to talk mainly about people and humans. I'll explain in a minute why. This is me. I'm a creative thinker and doer, and that's just a shorthand for 25 years in the creative industry. Um, I'm also an executive coach because I'm intrigued about humans, their dreams, their purpose, their behaviors, their motivations. And currently, I'm thinking a lot about how to help people to become better innovators. We focus a lot on technology. We focus a lot on organizations. But how to actually get people to become better innovators. So, very excited. And um, a little caveat, I am heavily dyslectic. That means that I love stories, I love pictures, I absolutely hate letters, and I don't understand abbreviation, I just do not compute. Which means you will hear a lot of analogies. Uh, and the first one, we're starting straight away. I was thinking about what is a keynote? What is a keynote in a conference? And I always thought a conference for me is a bit like a tasting menu, right? So the people of the conference come up with this fantastic tasting menu with brilliant, brilliant talks. They're going to think about the ingredients. They're going to think about how are we going to serve what. They might be thinking about the pace, the build-up. So here was I going, what are you serving in a tasting menu at the very beginning? Luckily, I have a friend who is an aspiring chef, and I called her, and she said, really easy, Alex, serve them a palate cleanser. Here was I, a palate cleanser, what is that? And she says, it's something to neutralize anything that they come in with so that they're open to start listening and learning. So here it is, I serve you your palate cleanser. Mind the hype. Innovation is a little bit like a roller coaster, isn't it? I can actually feel some of you going, yep, yeah, I've been up there, I've been down there, I'm kind of dawdling around in the back over there. We love roller coasters. We love the hype, the adrenaline, the excitement. And even if we don't like riding roller coasters, most of us really like the idea of riding roller coasters. The other thing that I find very funny is that there's only one letter difference between the word hype and hope. And that's quite well capturing our relationship with innovation. The hype, we love the hype, the hype of innovation success, the hype of technology, the hype of new models. Because the hype is a great expression of our hope, of what is driving us to do all of this. And I believe that we as an industry and in business should really tile up talking about people. I talk at human-led innovation stories and talk about how can we help people get better innovators. We have fantastic technology. We have all the models we need. It is really about trying to help us as people to make the best out of it. So let's explore that a little further. Innovation is all around us. I would argue that we should just get rid of the normal calendar, January, March, all of that, really, really boring. Let's start with December, and December is starting to become the month of all the innovations of the year. You've probably seen all of this in December, the best 25 innovations, the best 10 innovations, the best 15 innovations. What is January? Any guesses? CES. Yep, so it's going to be CES month. We are throwing away January. What is February? Come on, you're going to get there. Barcelona, Mobile World Congress. This is the S9, and apparently one of the most endearing features of the S9 is that it turns you automatically into an emoji. I am not that excited about it, but that's just myself. 
And then let's think about March. March, I love March. March is going to become the December of the innovation calendar. And why? Because we're waiting with bated breath for the punk child of innovation, the original child, South by Southwest. What I'm trying to do, a little facetious, I admit, is to show you that innovation is everywhere. It is our lifeblood. It is part of our social fabric. Innovate or die, we hear that pretty every single time. And I would argue that as humans, we know that we need to evolve. We know that we need to make things better and even make better things. And I'm like to find out why a lot of us are struggling. Because struggle is another big part of the hype narrative, isn't it? There's either the hero story, the entrepreneur who stands up there and graciously shares its failures. Well, the only reason they share their failure study is because they're very successful at the end of the day. It is always very easy to share your failure when you have a lot of buck in the bank. Innovation is also looking very complicated. You know, it suddenly needs a blueprint. This is the blueprint of the TARDIS, and if anybody can build it, please invite me. For those of you who don't know what a TARDIS is, it's a time machine. You need blueprints, you know, in order to build it. If you have a time machine, if you have a great innovation, you can rule the world. So you need a lot of process, you need knowledge, principles, right? Because they give us safety. They give us certainty. We love certainty. And if we are very honest, innovation has a little bit of an uncertain thing on it. How many of you have been in a situation talking to somebody who says, yeah, let's do something really new? Could you tell me whether that has worked before? I've been in many of those situations in my life, in ad agencies, in digital agencies, and in consultancies. And one of the ways that we try to create certainty where there is none is we make the up. One of the wonderful things are this. Have you ever written one of this in your presentations? It's beautiful, isn't it? Because it looks real. Innovation equals ideas. Innovation equals ideas plus leaders. Come again? But it looks fabulous on there, doesn't it? It looks real. The other thing that we do, and I am guilty as charged, is the art of Venn diagrams. It's another way of really capturing something that is fundamentally uncertain and make it real. What does this actually mean? <coughs> and then theories. I love this one. This is a beautiful representation of the Gardner hype cycle. And the hype cycle is actually really interesting because for me it's a way of how we as humans interact with anything, including innovation. There's huge excitement. Oh, we generally get a little overexcited, I probably more than other people, and then it follows with a massive big clash. And then I slowly crawl back up to see the light. And even though that is then starting to make money, I start to lose interest. What I think becomes even more interesting is if there's anti-theories. So we have models, and now we have anti-models. And I don't know whether you know the spaghetti principle. Those of you who cook, apparently, if you boil spaghetti, you throw it against the wall, and if it sticks, it's good. And there's a wonderful man who's called Lars Sutman. And Lars Sutman talks an awful lot about the spaghetti principle. Because he argues, we don't live in a world anymore where you have a long operating history that is stable and predictable. There's simply no way to plan anymore. And in a world that is getting more and more complex, throwing spaghetti at the wall might well be the best strategy. You throw, you test, you evaluate, and you throw again. You start maybe seeing where I'm getting to. I see merit in all of this thinking. I see merit in our excitement around technology. I see merit in our focus on process definition. But I would like to challenge us to think a bit more about the human in all of that. Where are the stories needed to get people like us to become better innovators? And for those who are still sitting on the fence, I'm going to give you five provocations that challenge maybe that current hype narrative. The first one, please, can we all just stop innovating? Now, I admit I stole that headline. It's my prerogative as a speaker, but I will quote somebody. So that is a headline from a Harvard Business Review in 2012. And it's actually written by the co-founder of Fast Company. 
And what Bill meant with this was, the moment that innovation is becoming a buzzword, the moment it's becoming yet another consultant-driven framework, it is actually going to cease to be a positive force for change. I'm supposed not to look at the slides because they're filming, so can you remind me if I look not to do that? It's very, very strange, isn't it? All models are wrong. Some are helpful. It's become the big battle move of the systems thinker. Did you know that this is actually 30 years old? I didn't. It's a very smart chap, a statistician, said that 30 years ago. But what choice did we have in the past? Only models from the theory of relativity to the theory of human behaviors helped us to explain the world around us consistently, yet imperfectly. I would argue until now, because data eats theory for breakfast. Companies for, like Google, who have access to trillions of data sets, don't need to work with 40 models anymore. They create real-time models every single day. They do not need to do the traditional approach to science, create a hypothesis, model it, test it. It's going to become obsolete. So what you're going to start having is there's data then there's some sort of black box where some sort of innovation happens, and then there's data again. Talking about the black box, my fourth provocation, let chaos reign. The late CEO of Intel, Andrew Grove, said famously when they asked him, how did you build a company so fast? It's really, really simple. I told everybody in my company to be comfortable to let chaos reign, and then I gave them the ability to rein the chaos in when they felt that they had great ideas. And for him, it was the only way to help his people break through traditional thinking patterns, experiment, come up with really great ideas. And this is the last one, and it sounds really daft, but it isn't. Innovation really starts with people having fun. Okay, so Tim O'Reilly, who is a technology thinker, once said, there's this myth about innovation that it has been started by entrepreneurs. And he's giving the example of the Wright brothers. And he says, you don't think that the Wright brothers were sitting there and saying, oh, we're going to build this massive, big aviation business. It's going to be awesome. No, I think one brother said to the other, do you know what? We should really figure out that flying thing. I'd like to be up there. Wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be brilliant? Let's go, play, let's do something. The same thing with the inventors of the internet. Very few of them were interested in money at that time. A lot of them just sat there and went, dude, I can send one document over to the other world. Isn't that awesome? Fun. We forget that fun very, very often in our narratives, in our hype narratives. So I'm going to give you six examples of what I call human-led stories around innovation. And they're all from people who lead innovation projects within their field. Everybody has been very generous. I just called random people up and asked them for their point of view. The first one, you cannot breathe innovation if you're not prepared to change. Karen leads the innovation practice at Adam and Eve, and she's a very dear friend of mine. And she says, well, you know what? The challenge we have at the moment, Alex, is not the technology, it is not the processes, it's about how do we get people to feel comfortable with change. And I think within innovation, we are sometimes not very smart because we talk about innovation needs to be big, it needs to be purposeful, it needs to always make money. Now, all of that might be right, and I am one of the people at times who criticizes shiny things. But from a motivation point of view, getting people, allowing people to do shiny things is wonderful because it puts your energy levels up, right? Has anybody of you any time sold a shiny thing to somebody because they knew they had to start getting their clients, their partners convinced about the power of innovation. So it's a good thing in that point. I generally find it very difficult talking about worthiness with the innovations when it comes to motivations. I worked in a small digital consultancy for a while and um, we had a rather large um, English um, bank client there. And I started to work with the BAU team, so business as usual the maintenance team, digital team. And they had really not a good rap in the agency. They were seen as fundamentally unsexy. Um, and when I started to work with them, I went, this is so unfair. These guys were innovating every single day. They were just innovating very quietly at the core. 
And Karen gives a really good example. It's Google. Because Google looks at innovation like a portfolio. And 70% of Google's innovation efforts is around innovating the core, the search machine, all of the little things that you don't really see. 20% of their innovation is around what they call adjacent markets, so Gmail. And 10% is around the really fantastic shiny things, self-driving cars, etc., etc. But as a team, everybody within Google is part of that innovation, and they all feel as if they're doing a big thing, as if they're making a difference. This is um, German translated into English. That's why it is very long. Um, and Bettina's fabulous. I used to work with her. If you ever hear her talk, please go and listen. But what she's saying is, how can we innovate if we are all looking at the same trends? If we're all going to the same conferences? <laughs> if we're talking the same language? If we are in the same innovation bubble? It's going to become really hard. She said, you know what, at Siemens, we kind of dig this whole technology we have started to find our way with design thinking and processes. For us, the big, big factor now is to get people to think differently, to not just repeat the latest trend report. And there's a lot of initiatives. I don't know whether you ever heard about cross-modalism. Uh, cross-modalism is a movement which is born of the synthesizers, see? That's my problem with words. Of art, science, and entrepreneurship. It is based in learning and collaboration of what I call non-traditional partners. So you would have artists work with technologists, work with audio scientists, coming up with new things. I think the other thing that we see at the moment is the movement around trying to turn STEM into STEAM by introducing new skills into it, the arts. That's Florian, and Florian works in Germany, he works at Border, and he is at their boot camp. And he gave me a great Schumann narrative, because he actually said, do you know what our biggest challenge is? We need to break out of the speed bubble. I don't know whether you can rely to that, but the speed trouble, what he means is very much that everybody here has a different perception of speed, okay? And people who work in a lab have a perception of speed that is really fast, okay? We think in sprints, we think in design cycles, we hurry, fast is good, fast is furious. And then we have to talk to another department, and that department might be looking after regulations, looking after policy, and you know what? That department doesn't think that fast is good, and I tend to agree. I'd like people to think really hard about policies, and these people suddenly don't work with each other because the speed is stopping them to work with each other. Analogy warning, my whole family are musicians, I'm not. Um, but I had to sit through a lot of music in my life. And one of the things about music is there is a lot of tempo changes in really good pieces of music. And when you play those pieces of music, you need to agree together when you change the tempo, why you change the tempo what impact that tempo has. And then it becomes a fantastic experience. Otherwise, it not so much. When you think about an analogy of worlds, and you think you have the lab world, you have the marketing world, you have the regulations world, if all of these planets just spin at their own speed, there is no way to align them. And they're all kind of stuck in their own speed bubble. Cows is all about a deliberate state of flux. Bo is now the creative director of Dyson for Europe. And he thinks that Dyson is always in innovation phase. The company has grown from 2,000 people to 11,000 people in 10 years. And in Bo's point of view, they are really just hold together by a very strong mantra of making things better by making better things. Bo argues that Dyson has been as chaotic at its heart since a handful of engineers were in James Dyson's shed. And he says, do you know what, Alex? It still is James Dyson's shed, just a lot bigger with security clearing. The other example he gives is IKEA. So he used to work at IKEA. And IKEA in Sweden, where all the product designers sit and product development, they move every six months. 
within. Slightly, slightly scary, isn't it? But the point of view is that they believe you make new connections, you have friction, and you're able to break out of your patterns and you think about new stuff. The next one is wonderful <laughs> because I love the serendipity. I don't know who of you knows Silas. I'm very lucky to work with Silas at times. And Silas said to me, Alex, I don't understand a single word you're talking about. I'm not interested in pro uh, uh, products. I'm not interested in processes. I just think it is about enjoying the creation of something new. For Silas, innovation is the definition of being creative. And he says, you know what? We are all so bloody blessed to live in these times and to celebrate our good fortune. Isn't that fabulous? And if you go onto his website, there's one beautiful collaboration that he's doing, and he's doing that with Sir Peter Blake, the godfather of pop art, and with HP. They customized a software that allows the ingredients of Sir Peter's artworks, all of those squares, to be put together and rearranged in unfamiliar and unexpected ways. And I loved the quote of the artist afterwards because he said, wow, I let my artwork talk to the machine, and then the machine talks back to my artwork, and then I as a human just lean back and see what happens. The joy of innovation. This is the last one, and it's probably the most meatiest human narrative. To create an ethical culture of innovation, you first need to turn those doing the innovation into philosophers of life, society, and humanity. Those who actually do the innovation, not another department, not another onion, not another layer. Increasingly, innovators are practically making policy decisions that affect human safety and society. And a lot of those are based on the original intent of their innovation, of products, of services. And a lot of us are not trained to think about unforeseen consequences. A lot of us are not trained to go, what would happen if? How do we train people to start thinking like that? Now, you see some things at the moment in the big tech environment, the partnership on AI, who aim to create a place for open critique and reflection. And here in London, we're doing some really interesting things with Dot Everyone. One of the practical things we're doing is we build a little prototype, and it is about exploring ways of allowing consumers to make more ethical choices around what technology they want to use. Because people are increasingly aware of stories about poor working conditions, about certain companies not really keen on paying taxes, about slippery policies and potentially controversial politics. So this is an exploration to see would consumers weigh up value-based ethical trade-offs that they personally have. So you go in, you click up, you might have four or five companies, and it pulls through openly available data around working conditions, whether they pay minimal wage, whether they don't, any information around taxes, any information whether or not they publicize their T's and C's. Does anybody of you ever read T's and C's? Does anybody of you ever understand T's and C's? Do you think we should understand T's and C's, especially when it comes to our own data? So, where does that leave us all here today? Well, I hope it was a little food for thought. I hope it was a bit of a palate cleanser. But I would really like if it also was a motivation to move away at times, just sometimes, from the glorious tech hype narrative to a more people-led narrative, to think about what makes humans better innovators, to think about how can we make, motivate them better, how can we give them better inspiration? How can we make them comfortable living in chaos? And how do we get them to understand their responsibility around innovation as we're moving on? And for all of you here today, I would like to ask you to always remember the joy of being innovative and making a difference. I wish you a fabulous conference and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex, what we've learned from our event last week is the, to open a window for Q&A, um, also from the audience. So we are prepared today. We have uh, microphones here. So um, after every talk, I will give us two, three, or four minutes to answer questions. If this surprises you, 
I will start with my question I have prepared. Alex, uh, innovation is one motor that drives industries, mm -hmm. but there is another part of an industry, a huge part of the industry, who are just copycats. You know, they, they are happy with the role of being the second in the market. Think about you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Think about Apple and Samsung in terms of innovation, not of, mass, not of masses they produce. Coca-Cola, Pepsi, as said, McDonald's, Burger King, Starbucks, and there is an, an army of copycats who do the same. Um, how do you, in your trainings, how do you um, balance those di different attitudes in companies that might think that innovation isn't so important? Well, I have been working very briefly for Apple and I've been working for Samsung and I would say that Samsung wouldn't be quite happy to say that they're not interested in innovation. Um, they are very interested in innovation. Um, I would say the same about Burger King, I would say the same about Pepsi. I think we don't all define innovation to be the same and I think I talked a little bit about silent innovation and really loud innovation. Innovation where people think it matters, innovation around the magic word, customer experience. Um, so I do feel that everybody, we as humans, have an urge to innovate. We are just not often very well set up to doing that. I know it's a bit of a cop-out of your question, but I hope you accept it. Oh, of course. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. You're very welcome. Thank you.